Hello, Emily. Today is December 22nd, 2020. My name is Paula Levine Kuhn. I'm interviewing Emily Tim for the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Please know, Emily, that this interview will be placed in the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection at UT Austin. If there is anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there is something you want to talk about, please bring it up and we'll talk about it. Because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need to record you consenting. So I'll ask you a series of five questions. Please say yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree after each one. There are three questions we need to make sure you agree to before we can go on. Voses wishes to archive your interview along with any other photographs and other documentation at the Benson Library at UT Austin. We will retain copyright of the interview and any other materials you donate to Voses. So um, I'll, ju I'll just add, no, I'll, I'll add that later. So here's the first question. Do you give Voses consent to archive your interview and your materials at the Benson Library? Yes. Yes, I agree. You have to say. Yes, I agree. Number two, do you grant Voces copyright over the interview and any materials you provide? Yes, I agree. Number three, do you agree to allow us to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes, I agree. Um, we have many questions in a pre-interview form that we have already filled out. We use that information from the pre-interview form to help in research. The entire form is kept in a secure VOSIS server. Before we send it to the Benson, we would have stripped out any contact information for yourself or family members so that that will not be part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at the Benson Library. Do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview and your public file available to researchers at the Benson? The rest of your interview being your pre-interview and this interview. Um, yes, I agree. On occasion, VOSIS receives requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you give consent for us to share your phone numbers or your email with journalists? Yes, I agree. Okay, we have now taken care of business and we can get on with the real thing. Thank you, Emily. What I was gonna say was that um, part of what the Benson really likes to get from you is, um, I'm looking at the poster on the wall behind you to see if that might be something we might be interested in. <laughs> But, you know, photos of you, photos of you growing up, your family, also the um, places that you work and have worked, if you have any information particularly related to COVID, um, brochures, flyers, things you've sent out to um, your clients, anything like that. And I will send you an email with the specs for that. Um, okay. And we'd love to have that. It kind of rounds out the story and um great and i might share primarily workers defense project related materials that would probably yeah that'd be great yeah. mm -hmm. okay so here we go <laughs> i'll send you a reminding email with some um you know basically we like it the files to be as large as possible so they reproduce the best way but i'll, I'll send you an email with um those details. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Um, so we're going to start with you and your life. Um, growing up, you were born in 1981. Can you give me a quick overview of your upbringing? Um, sure. I grew up in Maryland um, in a town outside of Baltimore called Ellicott City that was sort of just between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. And um, grew up there with my mom, dad, and brother. And um, when did you become interested? When did you be first start volunteering to help people and become interested in social justice projects? So growing up in the, the like larger DC metropolitan area, um, I think in high school, I really became more aware that there was a very 
large immigrant population, um, both in the smaller town I lived in and then also in the larger DC metro area, um, that particularly a large um, Latinx immigrant population um, from all over Central and South America, Mexico, um, and then from other countries all across the world. Um, and while that wasn't my family's experience, um, that was um, something that in high school I became very interested in. I became very interested in um, sort of what the political and socioeconomic drivers were that um, really it made it imperative for people to migrate to the United States. Um, I think I came across that almost intellectually through like books and through uh, particular teachers who, who shared some of the political context of, uh, in particular, the United States role in <laughs> um, destabilizing uh, Central and South American countries and, um, and how there was a very large driver for people to come to this country to seek a better life for their families. And so that was something that as a high school student, I became more aware of and um, through a Spanish class really started um, volunteering um, in the, um, in the immigrant community um, and briefly actually worked at a Spanish language newspaper uh, through a mentorship program at my high school uh, in DC where I would actually go down <laughs> once a week and work with a reporter and uh, you know, go and cover stories in the community and write up articles and that sort of thing just as a high schooler. <laughs> uh, They're very patient with me and my not very good written Spanish and um, really kind of gave me a little bit of a, a initial experience with um, communities that were not like my, my own community and communities that um, were largely immigrant in the DC area. Did, um, tell me about some of the teachers you had in high school. They sound pretty impressive. I had some really great teachers in high school. I went to public school um, in Howard County, really great public school system. Um, I had a Spanish teacher named Jeanette Stanko who uh, was really one of was really the one I think who encouraged us to read widely, um, to read both uh, to, to read and to watch films and and, and really around um, Latin American history and everything from um, like magical realism and Isabel Allende to um, to uh, more like historical um, political um, readings and really kind of opened my eyes as you know a very naive teenager. A uh, very privileged teenager that I come from a, a white U.S. born family uh, with a comfortable middle class income. My parents are both teachers. That really um, kind of exposed to me, you know, the other side of the privilege that I enjoy in in a lot of ways was the um, the kind of the terrible things that the U.S. government has done historically in the name of protecting its own country, protecting its own people, preserving white supremacy and white hegemony. <laughs> and, um, and so those were things, you know, I might not have used all those words back when I was 15, <laughs> but that, that that was something that I think really reshaped the whole way that I saw the world and my relationship to the world as um, a person with privilege in this country. Um, and that that really, I think, led me to have a, like a really deep curiosity around the things that would drive people to pick up and leave their entire lives and come to another country seeking a better life that would risk everything that would, you know, even risk being separated from their families for an unknown amount of time. And that that was something that I really wanted to understand more about that experience. And then eventually saw myself as wanting to have a role in, um, in trying to, to really be part of creating <laughs> a environment that like I, a society that I feel like we should be proud of that where where immigrants actually are welcomed and are treated with dignity and respect particularly at work um, and I think some of those initial you know values really um, emerged in some of those experiences that I was exposed to back in high school growing up and how did your parents influence your life or, or they probably let you do all these things in high school <laughs> yeah, they were they were very supportive. My parents are both teachers. Um, my mom um, was a like a, a early, like a preschool teacher for deaf children, hearing impaired children, 
um, and their families. Um, she traveled around the state and worked with families from all different backgrounds, um, trying to help parents learn sign language so that they could communicate with their, their deaf children. Um, she often worked with immigrant families, had to bring in an additional translator because the parents were also often hearing and the kids were often deaf and were usually deaf. And then um, my dad was a high school math teacher. And so I think that, you know, my parents really encouraged and inspired like a love of learning, a love of travel, a love of learning about things that were different from, um, from my own experience. Um, and then also um, I did, my mom did take us to the Unitarian Universalist Church um, for a while in my childhood. Um, but I think that there were some sort of values and principles around um, tolerance and justice that um, I was, you know, sort of first articulated or heard articulated in that setting that I, I actually think um, also helped me to shape my worldview. Although we didn't continue going to church beyond probably the time I was 11. But I think that some of those things were factors that, that did shape me and have shaped my worldview. And then when you went to college, you went to Brown, but um, I, why did you pick Brown and how did you continue your social activism there? Or did you? Why did I pick Brown? <laughs> no. um, I mean, Brown's a very good school. Um, I always, um, you know, worked really hard and wanted to, you know, really, that's another thing I think my teachers, my parents really instilled was this like importance of education and going to college. That was something that they like, you know, emphasize. <laughs> there was never a question whether that was something I was going to do. Um, and um, I think, you know, I really, I mean, Brown's a really great institution. And I think it was like, you know, really exciting and an honor to like be admitted to it. Um, and then I think that there were also things around about Brown that like really attracted me in terms of like flexibility around shaping your own coursework and really being able to choose and drive what, what you were passionate about. Um, and that there, it seemed like a community of, of that within Brown, I could find a community of people who cared about the things that I was becoming passionate and excited about as, you know, a, a teenager. And um, so to get into Brown, you probably had really good grades and lots of extracurriculars. Did you have extracurriculars besides your volunteer things? Or that sounds yeah. Like so I, um, you know, and I think I really at this point and at that point in my life really thought about like, you know, service and volunteerism and not so much about social change as, uh, you know, like I did National Honor Society, I did community service days, um, I played on the soccer team, I played on the lacrosse team. So there was also this, you know, sort of emphasis around, um, you know, participating in those sorts of activities and, you know, being a team player and sticking to it, even when I was like, okay, I'm done playing soccer. <laughs> My parents were like, no, just finish your senior year. Um, <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, so I did all those sorts of things. What else did I do? I don't remember my extracurriculars in high school. Um, yeah, they, like a lot of like community service type things. And then I think I, you know, I probably like wrote my college essays around what I described initially that like I did this mentorship where I was like working in this community and like learning, um, you know, putting into practice my <laughs> rudimentary Spanish skills and like writing articles around different experiences and issues that were coming up in the DC immigrant community. And um, I think for me, that was like probably one of the most formative things I did. One, just as like a sheltered kid from the suburbs that I would drive, I borrowed my parents' car and drive down to Washington, DC, Northwest DC a couple times a week. And, you know, as be an independent, <laughs> feel like an independent adult, like going out and like being given really these real responsibilities of like, oh, go cover this story, <laughs> like that kind of thing. It's always really remarkable when I think about it in retrospect that they like let me do that. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, I, I think that, that that extra, like as an activity is probably one of the things that was most formative to me. I also did like concert choir and, you know, th those, those sorts of activities, um, so. Do you have any particular memories of your volunteer work, um, stories you wrote about? I'm trying to remember. Oh, it's been a long time since I've dug up these memories. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, 
what were some of the stories I covered? I remember covering a story around, uh, this was the mentorship I did with the Spanish language newspaper, which was called La Nacion. I don't think it exists anymore. Um, <laughs> But they, um, I covered bilingual educa education. They had me cover a story around um, these bilingual immersion programs that were being rolled out in some of the DC area elementary schools. And so I went and talked to like people with the school board. I talked to teachers, I talked to parents and like kind of had this first introduction into like the ins and outs of like, um, bilingual education and um and like you know it was both sides of like trying to provide the needs of an extremely diverse elementary school population with a lot of um spanish as the first language um students but then also kind of you know i think it was an a, a emergent interest from other members of the community maybe they were trying to really convince like white community <laughs> members that they that there was like this dual language um bilingual program that people would want to to be involved in. And so I, I remember covering a story about that. That was sort of the first time that I was really introduced to that um, type of uh, issue. Um, I mean, I think that there were also some like cultural things. I remember there was like a soccer, like a, there was a DC soccer team that was running a kid's soccer camp. And I think I went and covered that too. Um, so is it like the, those sorts of, those sorts of things. Um, but it, as a like, you know, I'd be there in like a press briefing with a, a you know, other reporters, like real reporters <laughs> um, as a high school student. And so I think that like that also was an opportunity that like just kind of gave me this experience of like moving through a more adult world um, and moving through a, a, a community and operating in a language that wasn't my own that I think was really formative. So did you continue with Spanish classes at Brown? I did. At Brown, I took both Spanish and I began to take Portuguese as well. Um, I, um, I should mention that my other, ask about my high school teachers, uh, my Spanish teacher um, also um, had spent a lot of time in Brazil and spoke Portuguese and got me really excited about Portuguese. Um, so when I went to college where they actually offered Portuguese, I, I did learn both Spanish and Portuguese and continue to take those classes. Um, and then while at Brown, um, I kind of quickly found, so two things. One, I was like a work study student. And so I worked in food service the first couple of years in like the cafeteria at Brown. And so uh, interacted with like, it wasn't just students who worked in the, in the kitchen. It was actually a lot of um, folks from the community and from the immigrant community, which Providence had a pretty diverse immigrant community from like Portuguese, Brazilian, um, you know, Spanish speaking from all over the Spanish speaking world. Um, and then lots of other places as well. Um, and so I kind of got to know people in the kitchen uh, and like interact with that community that is like, you know, Brown can often be very isolated from the community that it's situated in and students can choose or not choose to ever have to interact with the rest of the Providence community. Um, and so that was a really interesting, I think, first experience. And then I later was able to transition my work study work to um, this really great organization called English for Action um, that some Brown students had created that was about teaching ESL classes. So English as a second language classes, um, to a primarily Spanish speaking community. Um, but that with this idea that the curriculum would be built around community organizing. So actually learn, it would be a learner driven curriculum where the students in the class would determine sort of what were the biggest priorities and needs for their English language acquisition. And then the teachers would like almost be like organizers and build curriculum around, um, uh, around those issues and make it really relevant to the lives of their students. Um, and so I had the opportunity to do that. And so kind of got into this English teaching, but with a little bit of a side of community organizing in college um, that took me again, like out of Brown and into um, like the opposite side of Providence um, where it was like a very much Mexican, Puerto Rican, Dominican um, and Central American community. Um, and I got to work with a really diverse group of, of learners and adult learners and um, and students and got to become very close friends with many of the, the students in my class. Awesome. Um, mm, what did you major in in college? <laughs> uh, this is a truly Brown uh, answer. So <laughs> Brown doesn't have prerequisites um, or doesn't have like a core curriculum. And so I was able, I ended up 
I ended up doing a major called development studies um, that's like international development. And so it, they, it sort of allows you to, through like your specific interests, it, um, it's like international relations, but has like more flexibility to it. Um, and so I was able to sort of like determine what my um, sort of like main interest areas were um, and to sort of create my coursework and like my own core curriculum around those things that I was most passionate about. And so I took, um, I really um, became interested in kind of this critical look at like international development in the field of international development and um, very particularly how it had played out in Latin America and how it had played out in Africa. And so I sort of this comparative regional um, approach where I took a lot of courses around um, West Africa, South Africa, um, and, and just and like a lot of politics. Um, and then also in around Latin America, both some literature and politics and um, history in both sort of both those regions um, and developing a little bit of a, a critical understanding of um, the, you know, the role of colonialism in both of those places and the role of um, neoliberalism and <laughs> in, um, in more recent times and um, in sort of a post-colonial project um, of the nations in, you know, at that moment, um, in terms of like rebuilding and reclaiming identity and retaking political power and the role that the U.S. and other sort of, you know, so-called Western nations continued to have in those countries. And I think at the back of that, there was always this piece of like what I mentioned about high school that like where I first became aware that there's these like there's these pressures and these levers of like what force people or drive people to migrate um, and that understanding more about some of what those contexts are and what was going on in those um, respective like, countries as well and places in the world as well as um, understanding a bit about what was sort of driving people to migrate since I was also at the same time working in this immigrant community with the English for Action and um, you know very much working with folks from all over the world who had made that decision to come and so kind of understanding the both sides of that experience. Um, you mentioned you received a Swear Center Fellowship for Community Service. What was that? Um, Let's see. I so the Swear Center was um, this really great institution within Brown, um, where they would bring students together who were uh, very service minded, social justice minded in um, how they wanted to interact with their, you know, community or with the world. And so it was both a place of um, thought and reflection. And I think it was one of the first places that I like also was sort of given this opportunity to like really reflect on white privilege and what white privilege meant in those words. Um, and so I think that that as an institution was a really important place. Um, it was run by this woman, Allison Simmons, um, or at least that was who I worked with there. She may not have been the head, but she should have been. Um, and, uh, and just who really like created space for, for Brown students to think critically about those issues and their role in the world and how they wanted to interact in the world. And they also provided some, some fellowships. Um, I think when I, I think the Swear Center Fellowship I received, I actually was able to use to, to, to live in Brazil for a year after I graduated um, and to do some work and research on the Workers' Party, um, the Partido de Trabalhadores um, in Sao Paulo. And so was able to, to put that fellowship to practice um, or to use um, living outside of the country um, and really learning a lot about the political context and the community organizing work that was being done in Sao Paulo, Brazil at that time. And you did that right after you graduated from Brown? I did that after I graduated. Um, I had done a, a semester abroad during my time at Brown with School for International Training um, in Brazil, which I also think was a really important um, a really important learning experience for me to sort of live outside of the United States um, to see what like a deep, deep inequality and wealth gap and like really like deep poverty and extreme wealth <laughs> looked like side by side in a country like Brazil. Um, I was in um, the Northeast of Brazil, which is actually one of the most impoverished parts of the country in, in Fortaleza and in Salvador Bahia for part of it. And, um, and so it became really 
interested, like, I think that was really mind opening for me. Um, again, coming from a place of privilege where I'd seen like, you know, the US has deep inequality as well, um, but that there was sort of a new level of extremes there. But I think what I really took away from my time in Brazil, like what really, like I learned from <laughs> that experience. And I, and I did go back again after I um, graduated, as I mentioned, and lived in Sao Paulo. Um, and then also went, briefly spent some time in Porto Alegre in the far South. So in a couple of different parts of Brazil, I think what I really took away there was like the breadth of political engagement and activism um, and the spectrum of the political <laughs> engagement in South America and in Brazil in particular, that was like, when you think about the political spectrum here in the United States and it's like Republicans and Democrats and everybody's kind of like really right here and kind of centrist. <laughs> and then like you think about like, there's a much broader. <laughs> um, and then I think what I really learned about that was community organizing. I just saw these incredible grassroots base building, like poor people's movements, movements of people who were like basically just you know, forgotten by society um, or considered a labor class that was entirely expendable and how people organized and exercised power and made radical visionary demands on behalf of their communities and their families. And I think of a couple of movements in particular, um, got to, I got to visit with the landless movement, the MST or the Movimiento Sin um, Terreno, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it's been a while since I've spoken Portuguese. Um, and that's so the MST and they like, they had this idea that's like, we work the land. Like they're mainly agricultural workers there, you know, like we work the land, we produce <laughs> like what comes from the land. We should also be able to own the land, which in Brazil, which is like in some ways, like the interior of like Northeast Brazil is very much like a feudal society <laughs> that, that the people who work the land and spend their entire lives breaking their backs working land don't make any profit or don't ever see any of the, the wealth, the immense wealth that's produced there. And so um, that movement would like, take back unused land and would build autonomous communities. <laughs> and so all of this was like really just like, um, I think really just formative to thinking about like different ways of organizing, different ways of exercising power, ways that poor people's movement and working people's movements can be powerful and can reshape their society and can reshape um, the world in which they live. So I think I learned a lot from my time in Brazil. <laughs> So then you came back from there and you did what? So I, you know, after I lived, I think I lived in Brazil for about a year after I graduated from college and I had begun reflecting like back on some of the work I'd done in the immigrant community in the US. Um, I also had, so I, I talked a little bit about how I was involved with that work at Brown. Um, before I went to Brazil, maybe this was also part of my Swearer Fellowship. <laughs> Sorry, I can't remember. Um, that I briefly um, worked for Casa of Maryland, um, which is a worker center um, out of Maryland and just north of DC in Silver Spring. And I um, had uh, worked there with this, um, with their employment rights program that was working on wage claim cases. So uh, was helping workers recover their unpaid wages when they were experiencing labor abuse by their employers. Um, we, there was a domestic worker program where there, we would actually go in and assist domestic workers who wanted to leave their employers because there were extremely, extremely abusive employment situations for live-in domestic workers. And a, a lot of, there's a lot of international <laughs> folks in DC who bring domestic workers with them from so with them from their home country and in the you know it's it can be an incredibly abusive situation and so I went on a couple of these like <laughs> that we would help people leave like we would go and meet them at their house at a designated time and help them leave from an extremely abusive situation and so that also I think was like for me this is before I went to Brazil after college um for me, I was like, had this moment of realizing that there's these incredible labor abuses that are being perpetuated um, in our own society, <laughs> in, in the US um, by <laughs> US companies or US people. Um, and that there's these like, like slavery-like conditions that continue to exist to this day. And so I, I had sort of started to become exposed to this intersection of labor 
and immigration and how immigrant workers in particular are just particularly vulnerable to those sorts of abuses and what i think is like not what what i think is like not true about that is that there's also this immense power that people have to organize and that was something i began to see while working at casa of maryland that we would like help people stand up and fight back against these um types of abuses that we would we you know that people had legal rights and that we would help them fight their legal cases, but that there, there also was this potential to use community power. I think I went to some of my first big protests with the iron workers union that worked closely with CASA at the time um, around labor violations on federally funded construction sites in DC. And so there was this also just this like eye opening moment that's like, oh, this is not just a you know, few bad employers. This is, federal government. this is the government, <laughs> exactly. This is the federal government that's perpetuating these labor abuses against immigrant and non-immigrant workers. And so I think a lot of that, this was also the time that the immigrant worker freedom rides, I don't know if you remember the immigrant worker freedom rides, it was like 2000, it must've been 2003. <laughs> um, so that's when I graduated from college. So the immigrant worker freedom rides were being planned. And so I was at all of these planning meetings where you saw this like diverse community, like you saw faith can leaders. You explain, can you explain what they are? The so I didn't actually go to them. I had to leave for my commitment in Brazil <laughs> before <laughs> they, they, they happened. But I was, so, I mean, like, it was kind of like modeled on the, the freedom rides of the civil rights movement, um, where it was this idea of like busing, bringing in busloads of people, um, Im immigrants and immigrant communities and allies from all over the country and just flooding DC and marching on DC to demand a, like immigration reform to demand a just treatment and protections for immigrant workers. And so I, like I said, I wasn't there for it at all. Um, but I was, I think they happened in like the late fall of 20, of 2003. And I was there like over the summer and was like in all the planning meetings with labor unions and faith groups and these like community, just like all the folks in a room together planning around this like, like bold demands for like justice for immigrants. And then, um, and I, I had already made a commitment to the organization I was working with in Brazil, so I had to leave and I, so I wasn't there. And so it kind of, when I went to Brazil, it, it felt a little bit like I had unfinished, like there was unfinished business. Like it felt like I was part of a, a movement. Um, and then I, you know, I had this, you know, amazing eye-opening transformative year. It, it, I lived in Sao Paulo. And so I wasn't working with the landless movement, but there was actually a parallel urban movement. Um, that, there were like, first of all, the the workers party was in charge of Sao Paulo at that time. And they, so um, they had just taken the prefeitura, like the city government. And so they were implementing all of these policies around like participatory budgeting. So where communities would actually get to determine how discretionary budget funds were used in order to address like the most urgent needs of their community. So this idea of like, like deep democratic participation that had worked in other parts of Brazil, like in some cities, it was like deeply embedded in the, the political culture of these other parts of Brazil. I think Sao Paulo was a hard nut to crack <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> because of its scale. But uh, but so like I was working with these community groups that were fighting for like their basic needs. Like sometimes they were fighting for sewers or electrical, uh, um, like, uh, you know, having electricity put into their neighborhood or having street lamps put in um, or just like basic things. Or And, and so I got involved with these like, or, like neighborhood groups that were organizing while I was in Sao Paulo. And then they, um, <laughs> they uh then I uh, through them I actually got connected to this like it's like the roofless movement Movimento Sin Teto um which was like um also the same idea of kind of the landless movement that was like there are homeless people we like there are people who are like because of the way this economy treats people like that are that don't have the means to have a home and there's all these unused buildings standing around Sao Paulo, many of them like public. And there's some differences of Brazilian law around like public entities, public lands, public buildings, where they would go in and they would basically make a claim on the building and set up an entire community in an unused building for, for people who didn't have a home otherwise. And so I got to actually go um, spend some time with some of the leaders in that movement while I was in um, in Sao Paulo too. So that was a bit of a rabbit hole, but that I, that that also felt like just like a really important piece of that work. Um, so I had this like amazing learning experience, seeing how organizing was done, seeing how, um, you know, politics were done in a different political environment. And, but I always at the back of my head had this, like, I had seen 
these issues that were in my, like, like where I'm from, like from the, the community that I'm from, the country that I'm from, that has these deep, deep problems <laughs> and these deep inequalities and this deep racism. And, you know, at some point it's like, I am grateful for the learning that I was able to do and what I was able to learn and take away from spending time in Brazil um, that will forever shape how I see the world. But it wasn't like my work wasn't there. My work felt like it was back home because as a white American, I am absolutely a party to all of the like terrible things that are perpetuated in the name of white women or the name of white Americans um, and by our government and the, the deep inequality that exists in poor treatment of workers and labor abuses, just all of those things that I had started to really see um, before I went to Brazil. So that it was really that work at Casa Maryland, I think that led me to say, I'm most pat like wh where I think I'd be most excited to like really be in solidarity and do um, be able to contribute whatever privilege and whatever power I have that I can contribute to this movement is really this intersection of labor and immigration. Um, and so at that point, I decided that I wanted to leave Brazil and to come back to the US. And so I started looking for work um, and I had a friend who was working at um, Casa Marianella here in Austin, um, which is a shelter for immigrants. Um, and kind of started out of the sanctuary movement for political refugees coming out of Central America and some of the like US stoked like political comp conflicts happening um, throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s uh, and like, and um, so provided political asylum or political refugees a place. And then by the time that I came to work at CASA probably in early, probably 2003, 2004, um, that they, um, we're mainly taking in economic refugees from Mexico. So economic refugees largely caused by NAFTA, right? Like this is the other piece of the whole push pull dynamics of who's who's migrating and why and why are people coming to the US and then being treated as disposable workforce. Um, but because NAFTA absolutely destroyed the corn economy and agricultural economy and the value of Mexican produce in the Mexican market. And so, so many families had been pushed to migrate to the U.S. because their life, their livelihood had been taken away by some of these big policies adopted by, you know, the U.S. administration, um, U.S. government. Um, so anyway, so I, um, I came to, uh, I had the opportunity to work at CASA. I was like an AmeriCorps volunteer for my first year. And so you um, you came home to DC area and then you applied to AmeriCorps and Casa Marianella was one of the options? Um, I, since I had a friend who was at Casa Marianella, she actually, um, I was able to like kind of connect directly to Casa and know that that was a good match for me and that they were accepting people. Um, and then I applied for AmeriCorps to work for Casa. And so I came back to DC, but already knew I was coming to Texas. and I. Never really, I don't think I'd ever really been to Texas before. I think I'd been to the Panhandle once driving through with my family on a road trip over the summer. Um, and so I knew I was going to move to Austin when I came back to DC and um, picked up and moved to Austin. And it, technically we were like volunteers at CASA. And so I would, uh, you know, you would work shifts to manage the house, um, which would house, I think it was like up to 30 at that time, the main house on Gunter would house like 30 to 35 men. There was also a woman and children's house elsewhere. I think now they have like six I'm plus houses. Trying to build two more houses. <laughs> yeah, I know. They're incredible how they really just take it off um, and how they house so many different people. Um, so um, I worked at the men's house. Um, and I immediately got involved when I, so I, I also taught there was like an ESL program with CASA and I, would, I coordinated the ESL program. So kind of going back to some of my experience with, with um, English language, um, English as a second language. And then- Did you uh, get ESL certified at Brown? <laughs> no, never have it. <laughs> I have no certifications. I mean, I took some trainings. I learned how to give like, the, I learned some different testing mechanisms. I was familiar with the best plus test, and, like, but I was never like certified. Um, and, you know, CASA's program was, I think, a pretty informal program primarily for their, um, for their members. It wasn't like, a, or it was not for the members, excuse me, workers fence speak, but for their, um, the residents living at the house. Um, 
And so I was coordinating uh, those programs. And then I also started to be right around that time, um, a couple of CASA employees had just started um, trying to help workers recover their wages. Um, so there was like a file box of like wage claims in the CASA office. And, um, and like, there's this really frequent problem that CASA residents face that like they would, you know, the CASA model is like you have X number of days you know, you have a certain, I think you have three weeks, like you get there and you have three weeks, you got to go out and work every single day and like try, or try to work every single day. And then the idea is that you'll be able to move out and move into an apartment or share an apartment with some, like within a pretty small period of time, because it's an, it's emergency housing. It's not long-term. The family house is different, but the main men's house um, was sort of that model at that time. It may have very much changed. I know there's been some changes to the populations being served and a greater refugee population and that sort of thing in the recent years. Um, but but so there was, it's a huge issue if you go out and you have three weeks to make enough money to to get to, you know, to step out on your own. And people were just like not getting paid for their work. They would go out and they would paint someone's house and they wouldn't get paid. They would go out and they would work for a landscaping company and not get paid. And so there was um, a couple of other employees at CASA, um, Kari Kane, Amanda Jack, um, Julian Ross, um, had started to come up with some like possible tactics to try to get one to educate educate workers about their rights and to um, really push um, to, to leverage those rights uh, through community-based tactics and some legal tactics um, to recover their wages. And that was how Workers Defense Project started out of a uh, you know, <laughs> couple staff members at CASA coming up with these. And so I, <laughs> coming up with these like community-based tactics and a file box full of people's wage claims <laughs> that sat in the CASA office for the first you know, couple years. And, um, and so that's where I, um, I wanted to get involved right away. I was like so interested in this. I wanted to. I wanted to volunteer, and so I was working at Casa, coordinating the ESL programs, but then like really spending a lot of my time um, working with this program, which had also just partnered up with the Equal Justice Center. Had just just right around that time found like the Equal Justice Center, so it was connected to a wage claim clinic at the at University of Texas, and. Um, and so we were running weekly wage claim clinics with law students coming in and getting class credit. And I think Bill Beardall is the director is the director of Equal Justice Center. And um, like, so there was this um, clinic model. And so I would go and work, I would go and help out with the legal cases every week. Um, I think they'd have the, I think it was a Tuesday night clinic. Maybe it was Wednesday night at the beginning. Um, but, and, and like actually like work directly with workers who hadn't been paid and help them either with the administrative or legal processes, like filing a claim with Texas Workforce Commission or, um, but we would also use community tactics. Like we would plan direct actions. We would make flyers and go knock on the door of the employer and say, if you don't pay, we're gonna flyer your neighborhood. <laughs> and then we would flyer their neighborhood. Um, and, uh, or we would do protests or vigils and bring in faith allies who would, um, you know, come wearing their clerical <laughs> garb and pray and sing and call beseech upon their like moral values to get employers to pay. And, um, and so we, like, there, that was, a, that was really my first, like, you know, starting to work with like what became workers defense. It wasn't called workers defense at that point. It was called <laughs> it's the longest acronym ever. The Central Texas Immigrant Workers Rights Center. City work. <laughs> That's a long one. It's a really clever acronym, City Work. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, it, so it was at that point, I had just taken on the name City Work um, and was housed at the Equal Justice Center. And so um, after my first year at CASA, um, Jennifer Long, um, was, you know, she could see that I was really passionate about this work. And she was like, CASA will pay you to go work at Workers Defense Project, <laughs> pretty much, although it was city work at that time. Go work at city work and, you know, do this work and do these things for us and that's, and it'll be fine. Um, and so I pr pretty much, that's when I kind of went from being like a volunteer, <laughs> kind of, to being a like employee and starting to like work at workers, what was, then city work, soon to be workers defense project. Um, and so, you know, and at that point, um, so they were doing direct actions or they were working on wage claim cases. 
there was starting to be a membership base because there was no formal membership, but there was there were mem there were workers who recovered their wages and then wanted to come back and wanted to keep organizing and wanted to support other workers to fight back because they were angry that their rights had been violated and they had seen the power that community has and that when they have you know when you have backup when you have um unity <laughs> that you can like fight back and actually even if you're undocumented you, that you can you know recover your wages and so we were starting to have this like community of people um who were coming together around these wage claim clinics um that was much more of an organizing space than just a, a traditional wage claim clinic um and so at that point um that was christina sinsoon also was there at that time and had started to put together leadership classes. And there's another woman, Areli, I'm forgetting Areli's last name, but she, I think she also worked at CASA for quite a while, may still work at CASA actually, um, but had started to build out a leadership class. And so we started giving leadership classes um, to workers who had come in for wage claims and then wanted to stay and organize and to support other workers. And that was really when like the whole idea of like leadership development and direct action and, and it eventually led to a very natural progression that's like, we need to have a more formalized membership base and we need to have a uh, members need to have a clear decision making power within the organization on the board of directors and you know like in committees and we formed our first you know started to form worker committees i think there was a day labor committee i worked with in 2005 that um there was a big issue with day laborers being pushed off of um the home depot up on i um on 51st street um and i-35 and they were being criminalized and they were being given tickets that they couldn't afford to pay and just for looking for work. Um, you know, there are huge like race, racial dynamics to it and like, you know, lots of spurring of community fear and like there were like that sort of thing that was all just like really misrepresenting that these were just folks out looking for an, a, a day's work. Um, and so, the, so that was sort of one of the first big like organizing spaces where we really put together a day labor committee and invited workers to come together to talk about what solutions they wanted to do, how to come up with ad and address issues that were arising at the hiring corner, um, and also what, like, how to, how to defend workers' rights, how to, you know, demand that you get paid, um, what you're promised, how to protect yourselves, take down license plates, like all of these measures um, that education and, you know, community coming together were coming up with solutions to address problems um, and to push back against this criminalization that was starting to happen. Um, and the, you know, police presence that was coming in to like ticket um, day laborers. And so that was sort of one of the first like campaigns that workers, you know, at that time was still called city work, but city work started to work on. And we, um, I can't remember the exact order everything happened in. Um, and then there was actually a intentional effort by a couple of city council members to try to pass an ordinance that would criminalize looking for work citywide. So citywide, there had been like in different, in a couple designated places in the city, there were these anti-solicitation ordinances, anti-solicitation zones um, like Cesar Chavez and by City Hall, where old City Hall used to be. Um, and they had basically made it illegal. Like you could be ticketed and arrested for looking for work in those areas. And it was very like criminalization of poverty, criminalization of uh, people of color um, type measures. And there was an attempt to make that a citywide ban on solicitation that you couldn't look for work in public anywhere in the city. Um, and so that became like our day labor committees, like in our, you know, nascent uh, member-based organizing workers defense project um, became kind of like the first big campaign to like de defeat this anti-solicitation ordinance. And we, you know, built a broad alliance of like neighborhood, like we organized within the community, the St. John's community, so that there was like to like kind of under undermine or not undermine, but like to take away some of the opposition and fear that people had around the, around the workers. Um, we built like we brought in like a broad base of like faith allies and legal experts and we like packed city hall. It was probably one of the first times that Austin was like <laughs> had to deal with us packing city hall and just being like, we're gonna be here until three in the morning because you're gonna hear every single one of us speak. And that was like the 2005 anti-solicitation ordinance. And we were able to defeat it. We were able to shut it down and nobody wanted to vote for it. And, um, and it was immigrant workers that led that fight. 
it was the day labor committee that like led that fight start to finish came up with the tactics came up with the strategy made the power maps and the like you know the 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 strategy plan chart like start to finish it was the day labor committee that like really drove that and it was this moment where it was like wow we can exercise real power um and we can stop like really unjust things from happening with that power <laughs> Um, and so we were able to do that and, and, and to end that anti-solicitation um, threat. Um, and around that time, I can't remember if it was like right before or after, <laughs> um, we also, that was where we were starting to form like this idea of like, you know, what is our decision-making model? What, what power do workers have within our organization? And that was around the time that we left the Equal Justice Center. And so we moved at that time, moved um, Workers' Defense Project out of the Equal Justice Center and um which was at ut no it was its own it's its own, it still is its own nonprofit organization um it bill beardall was a professor at ut and taught a class at ut and that was where the students for the legal clinic came from so there was a ut collection connection um and i think he continued to do that in the legal clinic and all of that. Um, but work, but workers defense, um, which I guess at that time had been going through like a rebranding and so changed its name from city work to workers defense and decided, we decided like our active member leaders had a big piece in selecting that new name. And then we, we decided we wanted members on our board of directors and Equal Justice Center as a law firm had attorneys on its board of directors. And that, that was its model. And so we realized that we just couldn't have we couldn't really be worker led. We couldn't really put workers into real decision-making positions within the organization unless we became an independent organization. And so we left, um, I think we were fiscally sponsored briefly by Red Salmon Arts, which is the uh, Resistencia bookstore. I don't know if you knew Raul Salinas, um, but he was a big supporter of the effort at, at that time. Um, and so we were briefly fiscally sponsored by them. And like, then we were briefly fiscally sponsored by a national organization called Interfaith Worker Justice that helped us with like some of our back office um, set up as a very, very small, it was like me and Christina Sinsoon and who else was, the, was with us at that point? Tori Gavito was the attorney at City Work uh, with the Equal Justice Center. She wasn't able to leave because her like fellowship was tied to uh, the Equal Justice Center. And Julian Ross had been the like ED, um, for the like initial you know for the project and and he left at that time and went on to do other things and then um and that was when christina became the executive director and i was you know an organizer um and i think there was um tocho angel a good friend of ours also was working as an organizer right around that time he might have come in right after we left i don't think he went through the split um but anyway that uh so we became an independent organization then and that allowed us to set up um a, you know, a board of directors that was partially made up by um, low, low wage immigrant workers, our members, and that were selected by our members. And then uh, the other part of it was made up by allies, so community allies, because we wanted to make sure that our board also had some of the ability to, um, you know, to provide the support that boards need to provide to organizations around fundraising and around political connections and things like that. And so for us, a hybrid board was really what made sense, but that part of our vision was that uh, over 50% would be worker members. And so they would still have a deciding vote in, in, um, as, a, as a group. Is that still true? That is, yeah. Um, and, you know, and total numbers of board members fluctuate throughout time. And I think right now it's actually exactly 50-50. <laughs> um, but um, our members are probably some of our most active board members. So they're always there. <laughs> um, go ahead. So can you tell me about what Workers Defense Project is now? Um, what does the organization do? Who does it help? Um, and then what's a typical day for you? In COVID? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is well, it, we're well, looking well, at it. This well, guest well, group at my mother's house. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, anyway. yeah, there's a whole series of COVID questions too. <laughs> I know I was like I probably got to speed this up and get to that part of the interview. <laughs> um, there's another so let's jump 15 years later here we are. Um, so workers defense is now a statewide organization. It is a worker center um, that 
uh, for low wage immigrant workers. Um, workers Defense has, a, you know, around 2008, 2009, we decided that with limited resources, we could have our most, the biggest impact by focusing on a specific sector and really becoming experts in that sector and um, fighting to improve that particular like that particular sector and we chose the construction industry because so many of our members came from the construction industry because the injuries accidents fatalities were just so severe in that sector and that wage theft was just so rampant so it, it just felt like the obvious <laughs> it, it felt like the obvious choice I think you know we briefly were like should we look at restaurant workers should we look at laundry workers and we even went out and did a series of like surveys with folks to understand working conditions and then one day we were at our wage claim meeting and I just look around the room and I'm like we have to do construction like we have like everybody in this room is construction like everybody like this is the industry that is the problem this is the industry that employs immigrants this is the industry that has the biggest potential to impact um working immigrant families and Texas families, if we can improve conditions in the construction sector. Um, and so we did. And so that was after like 2009, 2008. Um, and so we did our first, um, so we, so yeah, so just back to what workers defense is. So we are um, a worker center that is sort of a, a, a home for workers who are left out of traditional labor organizations, workers who are usually not part of labor unions, um, in our case, primarily immigrant, um, low wage sectors, primarily construction. Um, we provide, um, we continue to like, very much like our roots, we continue to work on wage claim, claim cases. We have an employment legal services department. We have a, um, we do some education work. We provide um, like safety training and leadership development classes. Um, and we do policy advocacy work has been a big piece of our work. Um, Starting in 2009, um, we, we also conduct research. We did our first study of Austin working conditions where we actually went out and interviewed workers all over construction sites in Austin. And then in, in 2013, we did a Texas-wide construction survey. And then in 2017, we did a Southern Cities construction survey, including Dallas and Houston, and then a, a number of other cities outside of Texas. Um, and, and so like we, you know, data-driven, policy solutions, data-driven campaigns that are led by the experiences of our members, but backed up by data that's collected through our studies and through other data sources like federal, like Department of Labor, OSHA, et cetera, um, has been a key piece of our success and a key piece of our, like our ability to like choose smart campaigns, winnable campaigns that are driven by, backed up by workers, workers' experiences and the data as well that that kind of like shows that these are really truly widespread problems. And so in 2009, we, we released that Austin study and we, the, in 2010, really ran our first proactive policy campaign to win a rest break ordinance in Austin. Um, and then went on to, um, to, you know, to, to win that protection. So also win some additional safety protections like safety training requirements in the city of Austin sites. And these were all campaigns that were like identified as priorities by our members that were based on their lived experiences on work sites. Um, and then were backed up by the research. So did you say respite ordinance? No, rest breaks. Rest breaks ordinance. Okay, sorry, I couldn't hear that. And I figured if I couldn't, other people couldn't. Yeah, no. rest breaks. So our demand was, it's so simple. It's so basic. Workers don't have a right to rest breaks in the state of Texas. Um, even if you work in 110 degree weather on top of a metal roof, you don't have a right to take a rest break. And so we were just demanding the most basic standard of 10 minutes of rest for every four hours of work which is a minimum, is not even enough if it's like really the middle of the summer, but is like a minimum standard. Um, and that in order to like protect people and to protect workers from retaliation, if they tried to take breaks and their employer would be like, you have an hour till lunch, just <laughs> too bad, which is what a lot of people's experience was because so much construction work is like done on a deadline. It's like, we have to get this work done today. Um, or you're up on a roof and, you know, nobody's going to insist that you climb all the way down and take the, you know take the time to like get out of the sun and get in the shade and drink some water and by making rest breaks required we were able to to make a like a really significant change in that culture so the history is in interesting that it was an offshoot of casa which is was in austin but now is your headquarters still in austin because of the political access to the texas legislature so 
I mean, I think we just have the longest history in Austin and the large, and, you know, for that reason, just kind of like the largest staff. I think the locate, like the proximity to the Texas legislature is really important. Um, we opened our Dallas office in 2012. Um, we opened our Houston office just in 2017. Um, so it's more recent. Um, and, but we do tend to still have I think we're trying to be less Austin centric, <laughs> um, but we do tend to still have um, a, a, like a larger staff and much of our administrative, I guess all of our administrative and right now our senior, like a lot of our senior leadership is in Austin. So That's something many, that we do think we should change though. How many employees and how many volunteers do you have? That's well, so hard to say this year. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, for employees, we have around 30 full-time employees. Uh, we have like a full-time um, Jesuit volunteer who works with us. Um, I don't know how many volunteers we have this year because we just don't have the same volunteer opportunities in the same way. But usually we, on any given year, we probably have like, you know, 40 to 50 active volunteers across the different cities. We, we always have several student interns um, we think it's really important to create a pipeline and to provide paid internships for um, students and young people who might, you know, be future folks who could work with the organization or want to go into organizing work. Um, I and so, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, and yeah, so, and so we're close to 4,000 members statewide at this point. Wow. So um, how has COVID changed your, your work? I mean, our model of organizing work and leadership development is deeply relational and like deeply person, like in person. <laughs> um, you know, our our entire model has always been based off of like weekly meetings where people come together around wage claim cases or around you know leadership classes or just just you know coming together um, in order to like strategize together and to work on campaigns and to. Um, you know, to do all the things that you do when you're trying to build out a strategy around building power for working people. And so this year has really forced us to be creative about how we do that. How do we create community um, when we can't be together, when it's unsafe to be together? And so we've, I've been really proud of our staff and our members for learning new technology. We actually have really vibrant, well-attended um, membership meetings, um, city by city membership meetings on Zoom. And then we've had a number of like statewide retreats or like statewide um, conversations around like really important strategic topics, which is something that we never really did. Like the cities would kind of like strategize, the members in each city would strategize in their own little bubble. We've been able to bring people together and to talk about, um, to plan and to prioritize and to, to, to move strategies forward um, at the state level. So I think really moving to online platforms, I think, um, you know, we've replaced a lot of our like in-person workers rights presentations and talks with um, Facebook Live um, with, I think we did some TikTok videos around worker safety and COVID-19 safety protection. Um, so like just really driving, like moving our organization, our organizing work into virtual spaces. Um, and, you know, there's a few exceptions. There's a few places. Um, there's a few like times when we've come together to do direct assistance um, disbursements. Like one of the major things that this year just became an absolute necessity. Um, very early on in the pandemic, we knew that our members would be left out of the, um, the stimulus and the CARES Act, that they would be excluded from state unemployment insurance protections. Mostly because um, they're undocumented? Mostly, yeah. And some because they're undocumented, some because they're like, you know, independent contractor, gig economy workers. Um, and, and so we knew that like, as soon as the pandemic started, that there was gonna be this immense need in our community for direct assistance. Um, and so we really pivoted our work. We had our, our members a couple of years ago had created a mutual aid fund um, that, um, that was really for very specific mission related type emergencies for members or for um, sort of other affiliated community, like other construction workers um, and their families. Um, like, and they were like- If someone was injured or something? If someone is in, exactly. If someone was injured on the job, if someone's family member or a member was deported um, and sort of the impact, like the, 
you know, the consequences of that, um, they could receive some financial assistance. Um, and, or if somebody died on the job, um, were kind of like the main reasons. So like workplace injury um, that people could qualify for our very, very small mutual aid fund. Our members did most of the fundraising towards it. The organization put a very, very nominal amount into the fund each year just to like support members fundraising activities. And, and then COVID happened and we talked to our members and it was just apparent that like we needed to pivot that fund to be um, something much bigger <laughs> that serve much more, many more people and to, to have like a much more st robust stream of revenue to it as well. And so we, we, we sort of rebranded it as a uh, Texas Undocu Worker Fund. So specifically for people who were left out of the CARES Act, um, they were like small grants. I think we thought we'd raise $15,000 into it and give out 60, $250 grants and be, out, and be done with it. And that's not what happened. <laughs> um, you know, first of all, there was like incredible generosity from individual donors and eventually from foundations um, and from other entities um, where the fund raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, Do and the fundraising or does someone else in your organization, who does the fundraising? And we, have a develop, we have a development director, we have a development team and like development director, myself, and then there's a development associate and a grant writer. So we have a fundraising team. Um, that usually are focused on raising organizational budget. <laughs> and then this year there was this whole additional financial need. Um, and so this fund ended up, I mean, at this point, wrapping up 2020, it's raised $3.3 million and moved almost that amount to the community. There's a little bit left carrying us into 2021, um, knowing that this is not over for our members. Um, and so there are still some resources that we'll have available at the beginning of the year. Did you get any government funding? Yeah, part of that, a large chunk of that total number is, um, so the city of Austin in particular, so city of Austin, Houston, and Dallas all moved some public funds to help families that were left out of federal assistance programs. Austin by far mo moved the most robust amount of funding. Um, and in, in total dollars or in per capita dollars? How do you measure that? I was just thinking total because I haven't ever broken it down by per capita, but Austin and also being the smaller city, I'm sure it's the highest in per capita as well. Um, and so um, we, yeah, we did receive some funding um, from the Greater Houston Community Foundation that was on behalf of Harris County. Um, Dallas, there was a very small pot of money from this Emma Lazarus Fund. And then in Austin, they created the RISE Fund. Um, and then they also created the high risk worker grant. And so our largest chunk of direct assistance was about two, it was about $2 million that was moved through the, the high risk worker fund um, here in Austin. So that's, there is- That's pretty awesome. So the government's using nonprofits that channeled the money directly to people who need it the most basically. Yeah, I, I think that was the big part of the theory that like community organizations are the best positioned to be able to reach populations that may not be comfortable coming forward directly to a government entity um, or to be able to determine like who in the community really needs the assistance the most. Um, and so that's that has became a very big part of our work this year, um, which it wasn't previously. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you know I think was really critically important. I think it also really demonstrated how like as an organization, we, um, our members have been able to build like political capital in order to move economic resources to, to the community. Um, and I think that's a really powerful and important piece of community organizing work and base building work. And how was the, how did the communication go from your 4,000 members to you and back to them about the availability of funds and how to distribute them, so on and so forth? That's a great question. So like at the beginning of the pandemic, we were really old school <laughs> about this. We were, we phone banked, we phone banked thousands of members in the first few weeks of the pandemic to just see what was going on. Um, and, and over the course of the pandemic, we, um, we really tried out new technology. I mean, we really like, you know, one people communicate through digital media, through Facebook, through you know, things like that through WhatsApp. Um, but we've really been using, we've been using peer to peer texting programs as well in order to to quickly communicate with 
hundreds of our members and give them the ability to quickly communicate back to a, an organizer in real time. Um, and so that's been, I think, a really awesome tool. Um, so what software do you use for? for we've tried to, we, we use both Spoke and, um, and Hustle. Um, and, you know, I think that that's been a really critical you know, a really critical tool. And, and again, like in some ways, like, you know, those things weren't new. They'd already been around for a little while when the pandemic started, but I guess, you know, as an organization, like, again, we were so used to doing things just by phone and in person and door to door that like the pandemic really, you know, forced us to learn new technology and to learn new skills that allowed us to communicate with our members on a regular basis. And I think that some of those things, even with, you know, hopefully in 2021, we'll be back together in person at some point in the year. Um, but I think we'll still use those tools. I think that those tools will, will make us stronger and more connected, even in, you know, less isolated times. <laughs> I, I totally believe that. I mean, the Zoom, the Zoom meetings with your other chapters has got to be really important. And texting is so, everybody texts. I mean, it's so yeah. instant, right? And it's so personal. Yeah, no, exactly. I think that we will continue to use the peer-to-peer -peer texting technology forever. We'll continue to do statewide Zoom meetings and maybe even have like local, oh, you can't make it on time. That's okay. Zoom in. <laughs> You know, like to just because like recognizing that like it's hard, it's a high lift to get people to come in person to organizing meetings after they've worked, you know, a 12 hour work day. And, and so can't, like can't afford childcare. Yeah, or if you don't have child care. We usually we try to provide childcare. <laughs> um that that is one of our sort of like gender equity principles that like we know that there's an overburden, particularly on women members and women leaders, if we don't provide child care, but just in general, because we, we really believe in a family model of organizing that we want kids to be in our spaces and we want both parents to be able to participate and <laughs> um, really have seen, even if we, you know, so many times in, in this movement, I've really seen like construction worker, like a construction worker and his wife will come to the, in with a case and then it'll be his wife who ends up being like the activist and the leader and the one that's like <laughs> leading the charge on it, on his case. And then we have, you know, plenty of women construction workers as well, but just an example that like, there's a real space for families to organize in our organization. Um, tell me about your husband. He's from? From San Antonio. From San Antonio and you met him? At Workers Defense Project. <laughs> <laughs> he um he was friends with our board chair uh previous board chair Armida Valles um and she, he played in a band um at the time called the Southeast Players and she Armida had the band come in and play for like a fundraiser it was like a Halloween party fundraiser and so um that was yeah, that, that was how we first met. Um, and he, and, you know, like his sister was in the band, Sarah. And, and so afterwards I like, you know, was like, oh, thanks so much for playing. We really appreciate it. You know, like all of the like <laughs> that stuff. And so then, um, yeah, I think we just stayed in touch and kept, you know, kept in touch on Facebook. And then eventually he started volunteering with Workers Defense Project. <laughs> he helped us build, oh my gosh, that, what year was that? It was like 2011 we built 142 coffins um, for our day of action at the Capitol. Um, wow. Our members designed it to represent the 142 workers who had died in the construction industry in Texas the year before. You have and photographs of that? Definitely, yeah. With us? I mean, that would be a great example of something to, to give to voses. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, he... Uh, and so he helped us, he came and helped us. We built coffins every, and it sounds so morbid, but we, we built, I mean, it's a really terrible morbid statistic. Um, the, like our members and then volunteers would come in and help, uh, including my husband, like every Sunday afternoon for like months leading up to like a March uh, day of action where we like shut down Congress Avenue and marched down Congress Avenue carrying these coffins and laid them on the front steps of the Capitol um, in order to demand stronger protections for construction workers. Did it work? Well, it is the state ledge. Um, it definitely 
made an impression. <laughs> um, it definitely got national attention and media attention. I wouldn't say it necessarily moved the hearts and minds of the um, legislature legislators. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, uh, to like pass sweeping safety reforms for the construction industry. Um, it did help us to leverage passing a wage theft law in 2011. We were able to pass a law that um, actually allows workers to make a re police report if they're not paid their wages. And so the, the police could actually like contact an employer and say, hey, if you don't pay your workers wages, you could be arrested for theft of service, which tends to be a pretty powerful negotiation tool. Um, Regardless of immigrant status? Immigration status? Well, the, the devil's always in these details, right? Um, but like in, in Austin, so that there's like a, workers, regardless of immigration status, should be able to use it. Now, whether the local, you know, this was before SB4, this was 2011. And so local police in a lot of jurisdictions were more explicitly not supposed to be interacting with ICE or acting as ICE agents. And so like this would only work in a jurisdiction where there was some measure of confidence that the police were not gonna ask the person making the report um, their immigration status and use that against them. So it wouldn't work in a place that had adopted a 287G agreement, like when the sheriff's department, sorry, when a sheriff's department, there's a federal policy that allows um, like sheriff departments to basically like deputize. <laughs> So it might work in Austin, but not in Maricopa County in Arizona. Yeah, exactly. So like, yeah, so there's, there's definitely that there's a whole, that whole other issue. Um, you know, and at that point, but it was, it was like a, in, in at that moment, um, it was a very useful tool for our organizing work to leverage, um, at least as a negotiating tactic <laughs> um, to get employers to come to the table and negotiate if they knew that they actually could face some sort of criminal penalty for wage theft. Um, we weren't, yeah, I think, you know, I think we weren't really interested in sending people to jail. <laughs> We're interested in getting people paid. Um, so there, you know, I think that now in an SB4 climate, we actually fully supported <laughs> shifting to a, like, there were a number of citation eligible offenses that through our freedom city policies we advocated for those to be um like ticket only or so you know when this when the police can use the citation instead of um arresting someone and, and actually one of them theft of service <laughs> so we you know have a in, in an sb4 moment in a like moment when we all need to be working to minimize the number of people who are going into police custody because of the disparate racial outcomes in the our criminal justice system. I think like, you know, we've learned a lot and some of our thinking has shifted over the past few years as we've actually, as an organization, it became, after 2016, it became, uh, while we were primarily an employment rights, economic justice organization, we did shift some of our strategic work after 2016, um, really explicitly to take on criminal justice reform is particularly where it intersects with immigration and the deportation pipeline. So really thinking about how do we disrupt um, like arrest practices <laughs> not, uh, or like minimize arrests that ultimately lead to immigrant families being separated through deportations. So that was a sort of a shift in our work between that time and now. Interesting. Can you explain what SB4 is just for the record? Oh, sure. So SB4 was a um, bill that passed in the 2017 legislative session um, that was very much an anti-immigrant bill, um, empower local police to ask about immigration status, um, which essentially oh, Texas. Amounts, it, in Texas, yes. Um, and that essentially amounts to racial profiling, like permitting police to racially profile, ask people their immigration status just because they're, they look like they might be immigrants to the police officer. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very similar in that way to SB 1070, which is, I think, the Arizona bill that people may have heard of that was passed a few years ago in Maricopa and, and really used <laughs> to attack the immigrant community by the sheriff in Maricopa County, um, Arizona. Can you tell me about your involvement on the Austin Advisory Committees and Task Force that you were involved in? Yeah, um, I mean, I think over the years, both myself and other you know, workers defense staff members, um, even, even members um, have served on some of the citizen, the council appointed citizen advisory boards. 
Um, I think one of the earliest ones, there was a day labor advisory task force that I served on, or this was back during the like anti-solicitation ordinance day labor organizing days early on it was probably the first one. And then more recently, um, a number of us have served on the, a number of workers defense staff and members have served on the construction advisory committee, um, which is just like the name sounds and it, a, a committee that comes together to um, make recommendations to the city around their construction policies, both on public works sites and on private construction sites. Um, so it looks at things like it's prevailing wage actually being enforced on city construction sites, um, made, it made recommendations in favor of the rest break ordinance. Um, and, uh, you know, can takes a look at other like broad sector wise, I, I don't sit on that board anymore. Um, I did for several years, I chaired it, co chaired it for several years. Um, but now one of our worker members is actually on the board. And do you think those, those um, participation by W Workers Defense Project on the city boards has been helpful. Has it has it created change in how think, the city works? I think it depends on the board and what powers it has. Um, I mean, I think I think like where it's able to just like make recommendations that that's important. I think it's important for worker vo worker voices and construction worker voices in particular to be heard in those spaces. Um, I know that when there's been like more limited purpose, like stakeholder groups set up, um, like around um, a living wage, there's also like a living wage uh, stakeholder group, both at the county and then at the city that were set up. And, they, and those really ended up shaping the living wage policies that were adopted by both the county and the city. Um, and so I think when there, when there were those more limited purpose, short term ones, they can really influence and shape the outcome of a particular policy area. Um, and so it's very, very important to have worker voices and, and worker advocate voices. Um, and then I think that like the advisory boards can can be an avenue to try to shape city policy around certain things. They can be used that way. They don't always inherently do that. Um, anything else you want to talk about with regard to COVID and perhaps maybe about your client, your 4,000 clients and what COVID has done to people working in construction in Texas? Sure, I can, I can say a few things broadly, although I definitely think that it would be great for the project to talk to a couple of, I mean, if like construction workers and their families directly, um, since they'll be much more able to represent <laughs> that experience. Um, but just like anecdotally, I know that many of our members faced really pretty severe job loss early on, um, like either reductions in hours um, as you know, there were shutdowns at the very beginning and then um, you know, restaurants and people who are in service sector or in care economy jobs, really in particular, a lot of women um, have really experienced a lot of job loss and wage loss this year. And it's just been devastating since, as I, I mentioned, that like most of our workers are low wage, most of, most of our members are low wage workers. They're employed in jobs that don't have any benefits. They don't have paid sick leave. They don't have, um, especially because the Texas courts have like stopped the paid sick leave ordinances that we fought and won <laughs> in three Texas cities. Um, I'm not even talk about paid sick leave. That the, so they, they don't have they're not earning a living wage. They're not putting savings away. <laughs> they don't have access to health insurance through their employer or through other avenues. Um, they don't have paid sick leave. And so these are all things that let, like when they were, when the pandemic started that like left people in an incredibly precarious situation. It, it, it's like entirely due to the failure of our society to create decent jobs in these sectors. Um, that people were so vulnerable um, to just being economically devastated when this happened. And so a lot of people went out of work um, and have continued to struggle to have work. Um, and then a lot of our members really faced just deadly conditions. Um, like construction was already dangerous and deadly before the pandemic started. And then the um, and then once it started, it's like COVID provided this whole other level of risk. And that's really played out. Like a, most Texas cities aren't keeping really close data on this, but Austin has. And like UT came out with a study back in October that showed that 
construction workers were five times as likely to be on um, to, to be hospitalized for COVID as any other sector in the employee in the in any other um, uh, employment sector. And so like that's, and that we've seen that in like, you know, statistically we, the numbers are there, but like we've seen that play out that like so many of our members have had COVID and like not only have they gotten it, but then their families have gotten it. Um, and that's been agonizing. It's been incredibly hard when, and especially when your main breadwinner becomes sick with COVID and, um, and then that just, you know, you live in a two bedroom apartment with four people <laughs> and like luckily the city of Austin provided some additional support. Like, you know, they provided the hotel where people could go stay in order to socially isolate from their family members. Um, and, you know, I think that those were really, really important resources that were open to all members of the Austin community. Um, but th this has just been an absolutely brutal year for our members. Um, we had one of our members um, and her husband become sick on a construction site back in, I think May or June. And the husband recovered and, and the, the woman passed away. Um, and so we actually had a member die back in the summer from COVID. And I, I mean, I think there's this whole other level to it too. That's like the isolation and the uncertainty, like immigrant communities already living with so much uncertainty about like their status. And meanwhile, in the background, there's like this, like, are they going to repeal DACA? <laughs> you know, are they going to take away DACA and the court system? Is the Supreme Court going to overturn it? Um, all happening in the background <laughs> in terms of just like adding stress. I think that this has been a year of like just incredible uncertainty and stress and trauma. Um, and I don't, I don't know that we've even begun to see how that plays out for people individually. Um, and like, we've, you know, been trying to, as much as we can as an organization to fill, you know, first those financial needs and to fight for policies. Part of our COVID response was like launching a policy platform that was like demanding that basic needs be met and that immigrant communities be included in like rental assistance and, um, you know, food assistance and, free medical care and like all, all of these things that um, like, you know, just our basic needs that are suddenly at the top of our agenda <laughs> to advocate for. And then we all, you know, it also included, um, you know, protections for frontline workers we've been advocating for and based on workers experience in the construction industry, some of our members like left the construction industry early on because they felt like they just couldn't keep themselves safe because nobody was wearing masks and enforcing mask wearing and, you know, and employers weren't making it possible for people to socially distance. They weren't actually following job rotation schedules. We, we fought and like came up with and, and like won all of these like safety protections. Um, but the, you know, the devil, the detail is always in how are they enforced and who's enforcing them. Um, and so a lot of workers are becoming infected on the job. And, and some of our like members who had been longtime construction workers left the industry for a while because they just felt like they couldn't keep themselves safe. They couldn't make decisions to like stay distant from coworkers and do the job. And they couldn't, um, you know, work in the heat of the summer and wear a mask without there being a real hit, like heat risk issue. Like there were all these factors that just were compounded um, by the specifics of the COVID um, pandemic. Um, and so like we saw so many of our workers become sick um, be unable to work. And then that of course has snowballing like economic consequences. And thank goodness we've been able to provide some resources to the broader community um, to help with those financial aspects. But there's there's so much more. Like again, there's these, just these structural problems with the jobs themselves that people are working in. Um, we also have members who are working in restaurants who became sick and became exposed once Greg Abbott opened up, Governor Abbott opened up um, businesses and stores and restaurants and for like in-person dining again um and it's like you know so many people have like for, for so many people to look back on this year and remember it's the year that they worked from home and they you know it was really tough because daycares closed and schools were like closed for part of it or were remote but like for our members there's no option not to work like there's no option not to go in um, because you already were living paycheck to paycheck and missing a paycheck means you don't like you lose your living situation or you're unable to buy food or like all of these things um, that are just like an impossible choice to make. 
Um, we also know that like we've advocated and fought for paid sick leave policies, had one local policies in Austin, Dallas and Houston, excuse me, San Antonio. And, um, and then we also, um, those all got overturned by Texas courts. In fact, in the first couple of weeks of the pandemic, a Dallas area court overturned the Dallas paid sick leave ordinance that had been in effect since September. And so in the middle of a global pandemic, they took away people's paid sick leave. Like, For economic reasons? Well, I mean, yeah. So it's like a very conservative Texas court and it's a lawsuit brought by the Texas Public Policy Foundation and employer associations. So employers trying to say that they couldn't they can't possibly afford people to have eight up to eight days of paid sick leave per year. Um, anyway, so th like the, the good thing is that the federal government did provide for the Families First Recovery Act, um, Coronavirus Recovery Act that, uh, that provides for paid sick leave, but we've had to like, big piece of our legal advocacy work this year has been um, at one, educating the community around like their rights to have paid sick leave under the federal act. And then two, educating employers and advocating like with workers to their employers that they have to pay it because employers like, like small employers, construction contractors, they just don't, they refuse to pay it. And so we've had to, our legal team has done a lot of work to actually enforce the the paid sick leave policy. And that's set to expire on December 31st. Um, and I don't, I haven't seen anything yet about whether or not it ended up in the, in the federal stimulus bill that just passed. So I'm not totally sure about that. I need to do more research. It's been a terrible time for so many people. Yeah. Employers and employees. I mean, it, it's, it's been yeah. tough. Yeah, it's been really, really bad. Um, what else do you want to talk about? What else do you think it's important to share? Um, I mean, I think I mean, I think it just all goes back to like the things that workers defense has been demanding and has been fighting for and that our members have been, you know, talking about and at City Hall at the state capitol the things that they need to keep them safe on the job or to like make sure that they earn enough to not be living paycheck to paycheck. Um, like those things are still just as relevant and even more so in this pandemic. Paid sick leave has never been more important. Um, making a living wage has never been more important like so that you can actually have some safety net. Um, I, and so it just, it kind of goes back to like, not only are we fighting now for people's basic needs to be met and to, to make sure that people will have access to the, I mean, health insurance, like people who are uninsured or don't have access, like who, or it's gonna be much harder to deliver a vaccine to, to communities that traditionally don't seek a lot of medical attention because they don't have access to it. Um, like these are all like problems that are going like that are are like even more urgent right now but are ones that like we've been fighting for and that we need to fix <laughs> like these are structural problems that like we can't just come out of the pandemic and have things go back to normal that you know it's okay for people to make low wages it's okay for people to not have access to health insurance it's okay for people to not have paid sick leave rest breaks like all of these to not have ppe and safety equipment on work sites um like all of these things like had if we as a society had like truly invested in these things um, for low wage workers and for immigrant workers, then the impact of the pandemic would have been very, very different. Needs for our members and for other workers. That's well said. Yeah, and what about the changing political situation? Do you think that, um, I mean, we can talk about Trump and Biden for quite a while, but is there anything in particular with workers the defense that you want to say about that? I mean, I think the Trump administration has, you know, been a disaster <laughs> for our community, for our members, like just living with the fear and like the immigration raids and the family separation, the deportation machine. And I mean, it's been a disaster. Um, Democratic 
you know, I, I think Biden needs to do go a lot farther than the Obama administration even did. Um, Biden, it, but there's, I think our members have hope again for the first time that maybe there could be real change. I think it'll matter what happens in the Senate, <laughs> um, the Senate election in Georgia that's coming up in a few weeks. Um, but when, I think- Wouldn't Workers Defense Project love to have the money that's going into that Senate race? Yeah, I just wanna see them win that Senate. <laughs> That's me, not as a workers' defense project speaking, but just as a human being. Um, yeah, no, the Senate will make a big difference in the hopes and dreams of that our members hold for this administration around immigration reform, around Green New Deal and good construction jobs and improving labor standards and all of these things that have just been like, you know, on the back burner for... <laughs> I've been on the back corner that have been under attack for four years now. And so we're going to have a long way to dig ourselves out of the hole that the Trump administration is leaving in terms of the damages done to the like to immigrant communities, the damages done to protections for workers and worker safety are things that are going to take a long time to undo. Well, um, will you all be involved at all in vaccine distribution? I mean, you mentioned vaccines. It's kind of interesting. Will any... Would I mean, I think you be advertising it through your um, text messages or anything like that. Um, I th I think we're definitely anticipating that 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 like just as a trusted communicator with our members and with the broader immigrant worker community, um, with the network that we've built of like our applicants for funds and our you know broader network that um, education and outreach about vaccine distribution once that becomes available it's going to be really important i think we'll be advocating for workers construction workers and other you know their construction workers were deemed essential workers by governor abbott early on and forced back to work even if that meant like really high exposure um and like as essential workers they should absolutely be and as a as a particularly vulnerable workforce should be should have access to the vaccine. It's really tough. I mean, you know, like there's a lot of other folks who should have access to the vaccine, you know, teachers and doc, you know, like, but but we absolutely think that like we need to make sure that the community is educated, that the community is not forgotten when we think about how to distribute the vaccine. I don't know whether we'll be actually doing like distribution what about lobbying for access to essential workers? Are you doing anything on that re in that regard? I think at the local level, we'll be weighing in on that. Yeah, once it goes down to that level. But that definitely feels like a big priority. Boy, you got a lot on your plate. No wonder you've been so busy. <laughs> yeah. That's right. yeah, sorry, it took two months to try. <laughs> Three months. I don't remember when I talked to Maggie. It was a long time ago. <laughs> Well, it's okay. It's been a great interview. Anything else you want to add? I don't think so. I think that's probably most of it. Um, yeah, I definitely think that it'll be really important for the purposes of this project to, I'll just have to figure out, like, yeah, if there's like, you know, particular, like actual members, <laughs> our members that you could speak to, um, or someone could interview. Well, I definitely. I'll send you an email reminding you, and if you can give it to us, I'll make sure Maggie gets it. Yeah, I need to see who can do it. It's, I mean, it's it, uh, it's a little it tough can, because it can be in Spanish or English. Yeah, they'd have to do it in Spanish. Yeah. Um, and it just would, ha it's just like a high ask. There's been a lot of demands for our members to like do interviews and things like that. And I think it's important. Like, I don't think my voice should be the voice representing what people's experiences were like in this moment. Um, but it's also a tall ask for people who are, you know, working <laughs> and like trying to trying to make ends meet. Um, but I, yeah, I can see about that. What's the time frame? Like, are there are there Spanish speaking interviewers who are available, or will that be waiting till more students come in in the spring? Um, I'm sure Maggie's got some on on call, yeah. and um, you know. School starts up again in January, but I'll 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 copy you and um, ask Maggie the question. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I'm. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how long the specific voices of the pandemic goes on. I don't know, but I would imagine another year, right? So. Yeah. 
there's probably there's time yeah there's, there's a yeah. lot of spanish speaking interviewers so um oh, good. okay okay well thank you emily all right thank you <laughs> and i look forward to um getting photographs and all that okay sounds okay. good i'll look for the reminder email with the specs okay thanks so much all right take care bye, bye.